Welcome to another in our continuing series of discussions on the scriptures of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Today we'll be discussing passages from the great prophet Isaiah. Joining me are members of the faculty of the Department of Ancient Scripture at Brigham Young University. Across the table from me, Professor Richard Draper. Nice to be with you, Richard. Good to be with you too, Andy. Thanks. Uh, to his right, Professor Terry Ball, also a professor in the Department of Ancient Scripture. Glad Welcome, Terry. Here. Thank you. And to my left, Professor Victor Ludlow. Nice to be Hi. with you, Victor. Thank you. Good to be here. Well, brethren, uh, we begin by noting that the chapters we want to discuss today, chapters 44 and 45, have a similar theme as other passages that we've looked at before, namely that Jehovah is the great Redeemer of Israel. He is the King of Israel. But there's a new dimension added to these chapters, and that is not only is He the Redeemer of Israel, but He's also the pattern for one that He is going to call in the future who, like Him, will physically deliver Israel from their problems, and that's the, the Gentile king, Cyrus the Great, Cyrus of Persia. And, uh, and these chapters uh, give us a chance to talk a little bit about uh, some of the historical dimensions of, of Israel's captivity, uh, as well as the doctrine that uh, the great prophet Isaiah was trying to teach to the people. Chapter 44, uh, first oh, six or eight verses of chapter 44, begins by Isaiah uh, telling Israel that uh, Israel is God's chosen people and that He will pour out His Spirit upon them as long as they are righteous and certainly in a coming messianic age. And we get some of the same uh, kinds of identifiers that we've seen in, in other passages. Uh, verse 6, for example, of chapter 44, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last, and beside me there is no God. So there is a, an immediate continuity with passages, passages that we have looked at before might say this, uh, just putting chapter 44 in a, a context. Chapter uh, 43 ends with uh, one of the most scathing denouncements uh, upon Israel because they have been blind, because they will not see. And uh, the Lord says uh, in chapter 43, verse 28, because of these things, therefore I, have I profaned the princes of the sanctuary and so on. But we turn the page and immediately we run into the words, yet now hear, O Jacob. I'm willing to forgive the past, everything you've done in the past, and we can begin anew right now. And therefore, this section really begins with a hope, with, a, with Jehovah reaching out to try and, try and draw Jacob now to him. Isn't that pretty typical of the, of the way the patterns in Scripture work? Uh, there, you know, there is the call to repentance, but always the yearning to have Israel return to God and God saying, it doesn't matter, I'll forgive you, I'm your God, I'm your King, just come back to me. And it's not just the pattern of the Scriptures, it's the purpose of the Scriptures. Verse 7 here, uh, who I shall call and shall declare it and set it in order since I appointed the ancient people of these things are coming and so forth. So in other words, these things are there, but I'm telling you these things. So part of the purpose of scriptures is to get this witness mm. and these prophecies in the record. All right, you've been disobedient. Here's what's going to come. Let's make sure it gets in the record and let's see how this happens because this will end up being a vindication, not only a prophet, is he really truly prophesying and, and foretelling that which is correct, but of God himself and his abilities, not only in this physical restoration and redemption that Cyrus is going to bring forth in this chapter and the next one, and we'll, we'll see it carry over, but of course the far greater redemptions he brings from death and hell eventually. Very well said. Another thing that I think is going on in these first few verses is you read through what Jehovah will do for his people, you get the feeling that he's a God that's, that has power and can move and do things for them. 
And then the middle of the chapter, he's going to talk about how all these things men do to try and build idols. It's like, yeah. you have to build idols, but I build you. So in, starting in chapter 44, we read in verse 1 things like, Your Israel whom I have chosen and formed thee from the womb in verse 2, which will help thee. Uh, again, in verse 2, whom I have chosen, I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit upon the seed and my blessings upon thine offspring. Verse 5, I am the Lord's. And another shall call himself by the name of Jacob. Another shall subscribe himself by my hand unto the Lord and surname himself by the name of Israel. And thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of the hosts, I am the first, I am the last. Beside me there's no God. I call, I declare, I appoint. Here's a God who has agency. He can act and move and direct. And then what a startling contrast that is as he starts to describe how they build an idol, how these and, men raise up trees and beat gold and do all this stuff, and their idols can't do anything. And that's a nice point that you make because in the first part of the chapter, the Lord says, I have chosen you. And then in the, the middle part, say verses 9 through 23, the Lord is saying, now you choose me. Don't choose idols. Choose me. I have chosen you, the one true God. Now you choose me. But instead, you have chosen these things that you mold with your hands. That's right. that you... What I really love is the sarcasm as he's talking about the futility of trying to worship an idol here too. Uh, three times he makes this point as he talks about how they, they cut down a tree and, they, and this is what they do with the tree starting in verse 15. He says, a man takes a part thereof and warms himself and kindleth and bakes the bread, he makes another part, and another part he worships. Part you use for fuel, part you use for cooking, and part you worship. And then he says the same thing in verse 16. He burneth part thereof with fire, part he eats, with part of it he eats, and part of it he warmed himself. And then in verse 17, the residue thereof he maketh a God. And then one more time he says in verse 19, none considereth in his heart. Now let's see. I've burned part thereof it in fire, yea, I've also baked bread on the coals thereof. I've roasted flesh and eaten it, Shall I make the residue thereof an abomination? Shall I fall down to the stalk of a tree? It's just, it's like saying, can't you see how unreasonable it is to, to use part of it for fuel, part of it to, to cook with, and then to worship the rest? That's and, well and, said. That's and, very nice. And, and, and let me just bring this up, going back over to verse 8, which is a, a moral corollary as the Lord uh, is this active agent as opposed to the idols that are non-active agents. The moral corollary there, there is for Israel. This is the message, fear ye not, neither be afraid. I am the active God, and therefore, if you'll worship me, you have nothing to fear. You know, just uh, do it my way. And if you don't worship him, and you worship idols, you do what he says in verse 20. This image is just perfect. Oh, I love it. Yeah, go ahead. If you, an idol worshiper is like someone eating ashes. He feedeth on ashes. A deceived heart hath turned him aside that he cannot deliver his soul, nor say, in his, say, is there not a lie in my right hand? I assume the right hand's the hand you're eating with. Yeah. So here you are, you've got a handful of ashes. You're really hungry. You're trying to satiate your hunger, and you say, mmm, ashes, and you start <laughs> eating the ashes. And you can eat the ashes, and your hunger can be satiated, but what? You're not nourished. You're not fed. Yeah. You'll still starve to death. You can have a belly full of ashes and still die malnutrition. It's, it's good for roughage. It's not much on nutrition. <laughs> yeah, How is that like Very worshiping well idols though? Isn't that interesting? People can invest all their time and effort in pursuing happiness in things they make more important than God. In the end, it's not there for them. It's just empty, hollow yeah. vanity. There, it, won't, it can't deliver. And it is so easy. The way you've explained this is so easy then to, to look at modern Israel. This is the case in ancient Israel. How are we doing as modern Israel? Do yeah. we do we hold up for ourselves these idols that are really ashes? And do we feed ourselves on the ashes and then wonder why our lives aren't turning out the way we want them to? And then another part of contrast in here, this, uh, he talks about liars and those that, uh, that, that, that have wisdom and knowledge like he does, a, a person of truth. I mean, you think of the father of lies and the things that he would have us believe and follow and then the, the man of truth and his wisdom and his foretelling and his bringing to pass what he's promised. That's another uh, act and counteract that's going on back and forth here. So he's really laying things out in their extremities. Mm -hmm. You can take the God that has created you and is trying to help you to these things that you create and ends up at empty ashes. You can take lies or you can take truth. He's really helping us to see the opposite so that when it comes to these little decisions, it shouldn't be any major dilemma to choose the right. From the foundation that he has laid in the first two-thirds of chapter 44, 
he then moves to reiterate the message again, the Lord Jehovah is the Redeemer, but he is also the pattern for another who is to come. Um, I, I think that is so worthwhile. Maybe we could read beginning with verse 21 down through 28. Richard, would you do that for us? I'd be happy to. Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant. I have formed thee, thou art my servant. O Israel, thou shalt not be forgotten of me. I have, be, I have blotted out as the thick cloud thy transgressions and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. Sing, O ye heavens, for the Lord hath done it. Shout, ye lower parts of the earth. Break forth into singing, ye mountains, O forest, and every tree therein. For the Lord thy redeemed, Jacob, for the Lord hath redeemed Jacob, and the glory and and glorified himself in Israel. Thus saith the Lord thy redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb. I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretch, stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself, that frustrateth the tokens of the liars, and maketh diviners mad, that turneth wise men backward, and maketh their knowledge foolish, that confirmeth the word of his servant, that performeth the counsel of his messengers, that saith to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be inhabited, and to the city of Judah, Ye shall be built, and I will raise up uh, the decayed places thereof, that saith to the deep, Be dry, and I will dry up thy river, that saith of Cyrus, He is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. So the Lord is giving Israel kind of a, a hint of the coming attractions and ultimately ends up saying, you're going to run into some difficulty, but just as I am your Redeemer, I'm going to choose another and He's going to redeem you physically like I redeem you spiritually and morally and emotionally and physically. And His name is Cyrus. And, and the greatness about Cyrus is that He is going to act like uh, a shepherd to my people. He's going to be in my stead and he's going to come and he's going to rebuild Jerusalem which will have been destroyed and he's going to rebuild the temple which had been laid in ruins by the coming uh, Babylonians. Uh, now to put this into historical context, there's no way in the flesh as a normal mortal that Isaiah could have known of Cyrus. No. They're like 150 years apart as far as coming along in the page of history. I mean, that would be as difficult for us today to try to say, well, who's going to be the leader of Russia 150 years from now? Even if we aren't even sure if there's going to be a political entity like a Russia 150 years from now. And yet here he is mentioned by name. First time, I think. First time, but we'll follow up with it here. And uh, because this is here, and because we normal mortals can't see in the future, some critics uh, say, well, this must have been added later. This, this, this must have been some later person that's added this. But of course, we as mortals, and Isaiah as a mortal, cannot see into the future, but it doesn't mean that God can't see in the future. And he can, through various means, reveal what he knows to his servants, the prophets. He's already mentioned about how he's going to confirm the word of his servant and perform the counsel of his messengers back here in verse 26. So he's in essence saying, I'm going to tell you right now some things that only my servants would know. No one else would be able to know this. And let's tell you a little bit about this Cyrus who's going to come 150 years well, from, later. From, verse, uh, from chapter 42, he has continually been hitting Israel with the fact that he is God because he knows the future. And here is probably, in my estimation, one of, one of the most dramatic instances. Profound. Talk about mm -hmm. concrete instances of that very thing. You mentioned the word, uh, he's the only, the, that Isaiah is the only one that could uh, see this because he's a prophet of the true and living God and, and seeing into the future. And isn't that the definition of a seer? seer I think sees. of Moses chapter 6 verse 36. This, this particular scripture pertains uh, specifically to Enoch, but it also pertains generally to all of the others that have been called by the Lord as seers. Uh, and it says of Enoch, he beheld the spirits that God had created and he beheld also things which were not visible to the natural eye. And from thenceforth came the saying abroad in the land, A seer hath the Lord raised up unto his people. 
this is one of the great demonstrations of Isaiah Syric ability. He is a great and powerful seer, as you say, to be able to prophesy something that would come 150 years later. There's precedence for this too. There are other individuals whose surname was given long before they were born in mortality, particularly in the Book of Mormon. Uh, we think of Joseph from Second sure. Nephi, chapter three. Uh, what uh, uh, Josiah, uh, King Josiah. First King, sure. why, yeah, he, he and, was prophesied. Mary, the mother of Jesus, or other. They, they is, knew her so name. Way absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, somebody talked to us a little bit about uh, Isaiah, uh, about uh, Cyrus of, of history. Uh, Cyrus in history emerges about 559 B.C. He starts out as the ruler of a small province, but then fairly rapidly, in a period of 20 years or so, ends up the king of uh, what comes to be known as the Persian Empire. What else do we know uh, about Cyrus? He was viewed as a very magnanimous leader compared to ancient uh, rulers at that time. Most well, of them were, modern rulers of the yeah, Middle East. <laughs> were thought to be quite bloodthirsty, yeah. demanding, but Cyrus was rather magnanimous. Um, apparently when he conquered Babylon, he does so quite easily. Yeah. Uh, and again, as a type for the Savior, we have this great deliverer who conquers Babylon. You think what Babylon represents uh, to us today. He, he conquers Babylon and sets the people free and helps them rebuild. Very so good. he comes from the east. He comes from what anciently was known as Persia. Today it would be the area of Iran. Uh, comes into Mesopotamia. Anciently it would be Assyria and then later Babylon. Uh, which is uh, Iraq which, today. Which is Iraq today. And uh, as Terry mentioned, uh, one of the more beneficent, uh, tolerant, I think tolerant is a good word to describe his type of rule, he tried to uh, accommodate to different communities and, and uh, nationalities that had been oppressed by the Babylonians and others and, and seems to have uh, been well favored by a lot of people. And it's also in the setting of Ezekiel, particularly Daniel in the Old Testament. Uh, he appoints Daniel as one of his uh, chief administrators in his kingdom and so it's all in that setting that comes some 150 to 200 years after the time of Isaiah. Very and good. apparently he was aware of this prophecy somehow, right? In fact, it's too bad that, that, that chapters 44 and 45 are broken apart by a, um, a chapter a subheading because chapter 45 verse 1 moves right in to uh, mm -hmm. the, the prophecy that uh, then is picked up years later by Josephus who tells us that in fact, yeah, Cyrus did come to learn about Jehovah's prophecy about himself, and it had a, an impact on him. Um, Terry, why don't you read for us verses 1 through um, 4 of chapter 45, because this is the great prophecy of Cyrus, who is the only Gentile king to be described as a Messiah or as an anointed one in the Old Testament. Please. So verse 1 begins, thus saith the Lord to his anointed, and of course that's the root word for Messiah right. or the Greek form Christ. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him. I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two lead gates, and the gates shall not be shut. And he says loose the loins, in other words, they're going to be afraid of him. Right. And they'll, they'll open up the gates to let him come in, which is how he ends up taking Babylon. That's essentially. Right. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy, which call, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob my servant's sake and Israel mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. Again, it shows the, the graciousness of, of God. Cyrus is, is not a Jehovah worshiper. He's, he's not there. And yet, because I think of Cyrus's character, his nature, the Lord now reaches out and touches him and honors him with this title, the anointed one. And uh, you are now anointed to do my work. You know, my grace now reaches out to you. And then the idea is now you be gracious to my people. Here's what I've done for you. Now mm -hmm. here's what you have to do for me. It's interesting that within just a couple of verses, Cyrus has been called Jehovah's shepherd or the Lord's shepherd. He's also been called the Lord's anointed. He clearly is 
a, a, a figure that points us to Jesus Christ. He clearly is a type and a shadow of the coming Messiah in the Meridian Dispensation. And to me, again, I, I know that this is repetitive, but the fact that he's a Gentile king. This is not an Israelite that's getting all these titles and, and is being described, uh, the things that he will do in the future. This is a Gentile king. You know, Cyrus must have been surprised when he heard this. I imagine he was thinking, I did all this, and now he's being told, no, you didn't. God did it. You, just, you were just his tool. Yeah, and he could have been even a little skeptic at first. Can you know, imagine him uh, recently conquered Babylon and to have a delegation of Jews come to him and say, our prophet Isaiah had something to say about you, how you're going to free our people and let us go back and build our city. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, well, in fact, I, I have the quote here from the Jewish historian Josephus who is writing uh, the first century A.D., and he, uh, he indicates that Isaiah's prophecies themselves had this tremendous effect on Cyrus once he entered Babylon and saw the conquered Israelites and was shown by Israel's prophets or Israel's leaders um, his own sacred name and writing. This is what Josephus says, For he the Lord stirred up the mind of Cyrus and made him write this throughout all Asia. Thus saith Cyrus the king, since God Almighty hath appointed me to be king of the habitable earth, I believe that he is that God which the nation of the Israelites worship. For indeed he foretold my name by the prophets, and that I should build him a house at Jerusalem in the country of Judea. This was known to Cyrus by his reading the book which Isaiah left behind him of his prophecies. For this prophet said that God had spoken thus to him in a secret vision. My will is that Cyrus, whom I have appointed to be king over many and great nations, send back my people to their own land and build my temple. This was foretold by Isaiah 140 years before the temple was demolished. Accordingly, when Cyrus read this and admired the divine power, an earnest desire and ambition seized upon him to fulfill what was so written." Unquote. Yeah. So that, that passage from Josephus, who's again writing, what, 500 and a half, 550 years after Cyrus did all these great things, is very, very insightful. It gives a little window of insight into what Cyrus was feeling when he conquered the city. And, of and there's a message here, if you don't mind me jump, jumping in with Please. verse 5 which is now to Cyrus, he just really set Cyrus out, let, know, let Cyrus know exactly what Cyrus is, but does not let him forget that. I am the Lord, and there is none else, there is no God besides me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. Again, that idea that yeah. I, I'm in charge. I'm, I'm the one, one that's... Look how often he says that, the end of verse 6. I am the Lord, there is none else. The end of verse 7. I, the Lord, do all these things. Verse 8. I, the Lord, have created it. Uh, verse uh, 14, surely God is in thee, and there is none else, there is no God. Verse 18, I am the Lord, there is none else. Verse 19, I declare things that are right. Verse 21, there is no God beside me, a just God, a Savior, there is none beside me. Uh, the end of, and then verse 25, in the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified. I'd, Boy, he you think, really you think he got home. the message? <laughs> yeah, well, I think so. Really and printing. eventually, uh, to me, my favorite verse in this whole chapter is 23 because it's alluded to and quoted in so many ways thereafter. He has revealed all these things. Eventually, though, everyone will recognize that he has foretold these things and brought them to pass. For verse 23, the Lord speaking, I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return that unto me. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear or take an oath or make a covenant. So eventually, not just Cyrus, not just the people that Cyrus may have helped deliver politically, but everyone especially those that God has delivered spiritually, but even those that have been from whatever background, everyone, every knee will bow and recognize He is the God of this earth. Just to uh, pick up verse 15, uh, piggybacking on, on what, what you've said, the Lord is God, He's the one who operates, but it is interesting that uh, uh, verse 15 describes him thus, Verily, thou art a God that hidest thyself, O God of Israel, the Savior. 
the, the idols are very visible. Uh, you know, the, the, you, you go up to the temple and there is the idol. But what did these visible idols do? Nothing. And yet here is God who, who's working behind the scene who brings through about absolutely everything. Yeah, through the Spirit, through His servants and brings about absolutely everything. And the rest of the story, Cyrus does conquer Babylon. He does allow the Jews to return to Jerusalem. I, I, never something like that it hadn't ever happened before where conquered people were allowed to return. And not only does he allow them to return, but he finances their return in the rebuilding of the temple. The mm -hmm. and, and thus uh, w we see that Jesus works through a Savior, that Jehovah works through a Savior to be a Savior. And therefore that, that one phrase right at the end of verse 21, he is a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. And then verse 25, And in the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. Boy, speak about a happy ever after. Yeah, it? indeed. Well, and, and that's the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ anciently and in modern times. And the Lord is behind all of it. Thank you very much. For more information on this program, visit our website at byubroadcasting.org.